everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the live virtual roundtable event where we'll discuss the future of compensation and total rewards in 2023. I'm your moderator, Douglas Brown, CEO at Halo Consulting, a certified minority-owned search firm based in Chicago. Halo was founded in April of 2020 to provide the process-oriented best practices our team developed at top executive search firms with a risk-free, cost-effective fee model tailored for early stage and high-growth startups for their most critical hires. If you're new to this event, Halo hosts monthly virtual roundtable events like this one for HR, tech, and DEI leaders on a variety of topics. Don't forget to check out the Halo series and Halo mini series, where we hear from executives taking a deep dive into what's keeping them up at night. And don't forget to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, the Halo Content Hub via LinkedIn, which summarizes current market trends and recaps our past events. This event is being recorded and feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A function and we'll address those questions throughout the session. Early next week, we will be sharing a survey to gather your feedback and we will post a recorded version of this event um, on our YouTube channel on Monday. Today, we are joined by a phenomenal group of total reward executives. Uh, we want this to be an interactive session, uh, so please ask questions uh, using the Q&A feature. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Cameron Lazak. Uh, Cameron is the Vice President of Total Rewards at Confluent, a remote first SaaS company. He has 17 years and five in, or 17 years of experience in five different industries uh, with a heavy focus in entertainment and technology. His past successes include helping launch Amazon Studios and Apple TV Plus, and he is currently focused on creating an employee value proposition centered around remote first work, transparency, and equity. Uh, great to have you on the panel, Cameron. Our next panelist is Bill Tompkins. Uh, Bill is an influential HR executive with 25 plus years of experience leading compensation, benefits, and HR operations. Currently, he is the head of total rewards at Smile Direct Club, a global oral care leader headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, where he oversees total rewards, benefit strategies, succession planning, and performance management. Uh, Bill specializes in developing segmented talent strategies and has achieved significant efficiency improvements through digi digi digitization and restructuring. Uh, as a consensus builder, he excels at propelling organizational transformation, engaging boards of directors, and cultivating inclusive and diverse culture where employees can thrive. Bill's career spans across name brand organizations like American Express, Gap, Coca-Cola, Macy's, and Nordstrom. And Bill uh, currently sits on the advisory board of Fresh Tree and the American Health Policy Institute. We're excited to have you, Bill. Thank you. Next, next I'd like to introduce Rory Trotter. Uh, Rory is an HR executive with over a decade of experience designing and delivering total reward programs for publicly traded multi multinationals that attract, engage, and motivate world-class talent to achieve shareholder-supported object uh, business objectives. Uh, over the course of his career, Rory has held various business-facing HR, compensation, and benefit leadership roles with companies including PepsiCo, Archer Daniels Midland, and Brown Foreman. Rory moved to Louisville in 2019 to join Brown Foreman in a compensation and benefit leadership role. In his current position, Rory serves as the secretary to the compensation committee of Brown Foreman Board of Directors, acting as a manager, acting as management's primary liaison to the board on executive and director compensation, agenda setting, global equity administration, and CDNA development. He also holds leadership roles for Brown Foreman's global compensation, retirement and compliance functions with responsibility for teams supporting the company's uh, 5,200 employees in 40 plus countries uh, in these areas. Rory also serves as a fiduciary for the company's US retirement programs, sitting on the employee benefit committee and investment committee. Thanks for joining us, Rory. Lastly, uh, we are joined by Deb Wasserman, uh, Vice President of Total Rewards at Oak Street Health, where she oversees the company's compensation, benefits, and employee wellness program. Uh, in the course of her 20 plus year total reward career, uh, she has overseen various functions at other companies, including benefits, compensation, wellness, HRIS, global mobility, immigration, and service delivery. Uh, Deb enjoys the variety of work and projects that arise with total rewards and is continually looking for new and inventive ways to, uh, to help employees recognize the value of what the company provides. We're happy to have you, Deb. 
All right, let, let's dive into our first question. Uh, how has the shift to a remote first hybrid workplace impacted the organization's total reward strategy and what steps are you taking uh, to ensure pay equity for employees is the new normal? Deb, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thank you and thanks for having me, Doug. Um, we are based in Chicago and so our headquarters are here. We are a national company, but based in Chicago. So one of the things that changed pretty quickly when COVID began and people began to work at home was just how we go about market pricing roles because for all of our corporate folks, it was by and large Chicago-based. You know, we would do a geographic differential to figure out what to pay people. And it was very straightforward. And what happened with COVID is we found a lot of our Chicagoans have moved all over the country because we are now maintaining the work from home situation in fact, like full time, five days a week. So we have people literally almost in all 50 states. And so as you can imagine, the geographic differential for Chicago is kind of, you know, a non-issue now. And now we, we are benchmarking more nationally in terms of what we pay people, but we are giving some discretion depending on where that might be. As you probably know, you have to, in certain states, uh, post in terms of what the pay range is. So now for every corporate role, because it could be someone hired in any of the 50 states, even abroad even, uh, we are having to certainly follow that. Um, and so it's been it's been different, you know, it's it's definitely been a plus for our employees, but following all the state regulations and making sure we're paying people appropriately according to where they are has has changed. We're still evolving with it, but we have figured out that, you know, doing the Chicago geographic differential is just not going to work. Um, from a benefit standpoint, we, you know, a lot of perks and events and programs were held locally. You know, it could be like the gym that we have. We give a gym discount in some of the companies I've worked at or just like, you know, some of the wellness events and you can't do that anymore. So with the new remote situation, we are still trying to figure out what is the best way to navigate getting information to people and holding events. We've done a lot of things creatively, virtually. We even had um, like a cheese tasting virtually <laughs> where everybody got, you know, as part of this women's mentoring program, something in the mail. So I really think for benefits, the benefits inherently didn't change, but how we are communicating them and the events we're doing and all the perks around them is what we're having to communicate differently now. Yes, um, the only thing I would actually add to that, I appreciate all the things that are going on, is this is a unique opportunity with a with companies that are now remote first. So Smile Direct Club is based in Nashville, Tennessee, so not the highest paying market. Um, I I have never worked in Nashville, Tennessee. I I live on Pacific time, uh, specifically right now in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. So uh, I work, you know, um, you know, all all sorts of hours uh, uh, differently than I did before. But what it's allowed us to do is really now recruit nationally for talent. So we've been able to get the best uh, the best uh, technology people, AI people, machine learning people. So it's not just about hey, we need to move you to Nashville. You could stay in the Bay Area of California. You could stay in Austin, Texas. And we'll do that. Now, the challenges you have, a couple of things you talked about pay equity, Doug, which is, well, you could have a technology director who's living and work sitting in, um, I don't know, Arkansas, but if they hire a manager underneath them that lives in, you know, in Silicon Valley, that manager may make more than their director. So the question is, how do you resolve and look at pay, pay equity when there's no longer this at a location to, you know, to deal with? And, uh, we tend to shift a little bit more of our analytics to a full uh, pay parity, which is looking at the median pay of all women in the company and the median pay of all men in the company so that we could look at the type of representation we have going up the, the organization. But I haven't figured out the pay equity piece of it yet with people scattered all over the country. And, and thanks. I agree with everything uh, Deb and Bill said. Um, the, the one thing I would add is that we have now come across uh, a mobility issue as well. So you hire somebody in Arkansas, but they want to move to New York or California. And um, the simplest thing to do is to say, look, you have your geos and we're going to do a mathematical 10% up or down or whatever. We've actually found that that hurts pay equity um, because while you think there's a 10% gap between sort of your premium and major markets, uh, there tends to be less than that because you know, you're know you having a little bit of... Uh, you have managers on the West Coast that are negotiating still, and they they don't always do the ten percent. So, uh, just a recommendation that we've seen through, you know, that I would give is that um, it's good to look at those markets individually as you're moving people into them, because it may not be a ten percent in Chicago versus you know, say Silicon Valley, where it could be more than a ten percent in Dallas or Austin. And so, we've actually sort of had a you know, with our 
talent acquisition team when internal when a person wants to move or goes into an internal rack, it sort of triggers a pay review. And, and it's an extra step, but we, we've come to see that sometimes it results in, in, in no pay decrease. And sometimes it's actually more than 10% if, if they're doing a move like that. And so from a pay equity standpoint in particular, we sort of let the data do the talking by, by region and, and by market more than just sort of applying a flat 10% up or down. So it's it's nuanced, but it was a it was a headache for about a year until we got it right. So thought I'd share that. Yep. And the only thing I would add there, a great you know overview from uh, the, the panel uh, so far would just be from a um, diversity, yeah, equity, and inclusion um, standpoint. Uh, the talent strategy uh, shifts a little bit in the sense that in some of the higher cost of labor markets, there tend to be a higher concentration of. Um, you know, talent that are uh, that are diverse, and if you want to, you'll be able to compete for uh, that talent in a marketplace where there are just more um, people that are looking um, to work remotely. It's a little bit harder um, to um, recruit, uh, you know, roles that are in a physical, uh, you know, space without running into internal equity issues. Deb, follow up question for you. I know uh, in your response you mentioned, you know, with with job descriptions and job posting themselves, having to post compensation for the roles that um, your team is recruiting for, how, how has that impacted candidates applying for, for these corporate roles? Um, yeah, we were very thoughtful in what we wanted to post because we realized we don't want people who are incumbents to feel that, hey, you know, I, you're posting something that is more than what I'm making and because that could potentially happen. And at the same time, we didn't want to turn candidates away because they didn't see the breadth of what the range could be. So so what we're doing is really looking at the incumbents, you know, which could span, like, let's say for just what we call an associate professional level role, that could be anything from IT to HR to engineering, but we're taking the whole gamut and kind of saying what's the minimum person and what's the max, we're going to do percentiles, but we, we went broad to make sure that for both the incumbents are feeling okay and the people, the candidates who are applying are feeling okay, that it could potentially meet what they want to earn. Um, we have a few caveats in what we say uh, that, you know, we explain that there could be discretion otherwise, but we thought that was the best way to represent what potentially could happen. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, actually, what we are trying to do is, to what Deb is saying, look at the, in, it's incumbents first, I think we want to protect. And um, so we basically said, let's look at the roles, no matter where they are in the country. And then we could start that posting range at, let's say, 10% below the lowest paid person, and then go 10% above the highest paid person. So that every, in a sense, every internal employee can see themselves in the range, and 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 then it gives you flexibility, of course, for the for the on the recruiting side as well. We've actually taken even more of a conservative approach, Bill, to where it's sort of like minimum to midpoint of the range, um, and that is where probably sixty percent of the population sits. Uh, but our employees, we've sort of set it up to where they intentionally can can see themselves over the range where where applicable, and, and yeah. we're willing to negotiate above that, obviously, but. We felt comfortable being that more than half were were sort of in that in that field. Um, but again, I, I think Nashville versus sort of West Coast too. Like we don't want to be too aggressive on top of aggressive comp anyway. And if you're if you're seeing anything like I am for the first time in fifteen years, you know some of these survey data points are starting to slowly trickle down. And so it's like you don't want to over index on, on what you're what you're saying out there. But it's going to be an interesting twelve months to see where you know, all of us set these internal ranges because um, people are trying to figure it out. Let's move on to the next question. In today's landscape, what concerns does the group have on balancing the cost of compensation and benefits with the perceived value to employees ensuring they feel valued and supported? Rory, would you like to weigh in on this question? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think that some of the, the big challenges here are get the highest inflation in 40 plus years. And uh, from a cost of labor standpoint, uh, the market really is not, not keeping pace with that. There are you know, larger merit increases and um, increases of compensation, but by and large, uh, cost of labor is not aligned uh, with um, the, the increases we're seeing in cost of living. And so any capital investments that you make um, in, in talent are gonna be built a little bit less than they um, have typically been built in the, the past. Um, but at the same time, you've got to, uh, continue to stay, um, you know, broadly competitive with the external uh, marketplace. So I think that the challenge um, that uh, keeps me up at, at night, if you you will, is uh, how to manage uh, employees' expectations uh, around pay uh, with the reality of what sort of capital investments you can make, particularly um, in some markets like Argentina, Turkey, where we're seeing 
um, double digit inflation, you know, triple digit unofficial inflation, and figuring out a way to make sure um, that there's still that that um, you know alignment between employees' expectations uh, and um, you know the broader uh, you know external uh, landscape. I would say that the big focus that has been helpful uh, for us is looking um, for dollar awards that may be one-time payments, um, you know, gratitude type bonuses, looking at ways to communicate the value um, proposition and um, appreciation uh, for employees working uh, at the company without uh, increasing uh, fixed costs on an ongoing basis. I think I also, uh, just to add to that, I think I also found that, uh, the, you know, the value proposition you know, goes beyond the cost of compensation, you know, and, and, and benefits. It's about the flexibility that you have in, in the workplace. You know, the remote hybrid model has been a big uh, source of satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Um, and, and for example, I was at an HR association meeting a few weeks ago, and they said, for the first time, even in union negotiations, <laughs> you know, the actual, the, the workers are asking for less. <laughs> They want, you know, instead of saying, hey, we, you know, the, the negotiator saying, I got you all, I got you all extra overtime. They're saying, no, we don't want the overtime. We want time with our families. We want time to, to do what we want to do in our life. So it's, it's uh, people are sort of rebalancing what's important to them. And, you know, it's not purely about, you know, about pay anymore. Or it's not about foosball tables in the, uh, in the cafeteria. You know, it's, it's really about being heard. It's about understanding where your career can move. And uh, and having flexibility. I mean, here I am in the lobby of the a conference board conference in San Diego today. Um, you know, doing doing this call. So, it you know that's that's what life is changing to. We, we literally um, said some of these messages just this past week because it's our year end kind of communication. Here's what your merit increase is, and we did a ton of education with our managers to say we're not going to meet people's expectations with inflation. We already know that they've already you know come to us asking if that would be the case. So our messaging to our employees was really clear that we did increase our merit budget uh, according you know, to what's going on with inflation, but um, it's certainly probably not maybe what you were expecting and we're doing the best we can with what we can afford. Because a lot of times people don't think about the fact that you know, we're able to like forego having to lay off people or, or anything like that because we make really good financial decisions. So we're trying to help managers help people understand that you know, it's it's meeting your needs as much as we can and what's going on in the macro environment as well as what is best for the company's financial, you know, stability and things like that. So, um, and, and to Bill's point about, you know, whether it's work from home or whatever else it is, we're trying to really communicate the rest of what you get from the company because a lot of times people just don't even know. They're so busy and we have medical clinics and so people run around, they don't even have time to read emails truthfully. So, just conveying as much as we can in different creative ways what else they might be getting if it's not going to meet their needs maybe or their expectation over here maybe it is in all these other ways we just have to help them see that this is a follow-up question for for the panel in in terms of um you know these these initiatives that um you know are being offered to employees are is is this something that is just going to be offered in the short term is this a long-term solution and you know how how will that how will that affect um you know the bottom line moving forward so I'll say that um, it's a mix of, of both. When I think about things like what um, you know, Ron Foreman did last year with a one-time gratitude bonus that was you know four percent of pay to everyone across the company, we were really clear: hey, this is not a regular thing. We didn't even directly tie it um, to an inflationary message. It was hey, here's this 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 thank you for um, you know sticking with the company during what has been a difficult you know last several several years. Uh, conversely, uh, to, to Deborah's uh, point around this broader focus on um, highlighting the, the expanded value proposition of working uh, with the company, um, there's a significant in, in, um, focus on employee experience and being an, um, a, a premium employee experience company. And some of those more qualitative uh, things um, are, are things I think we'll, we'll continue to highlight and focus on in our communication strategy uh, for, for years to come. Uh, you know, we're currently in the process of lo rolling out a total rewards portal that's going to show everybody you know, their pay, their benefits, but also really emphasizing these things that are kind of unique uh, to the company, like product allowances of you know several hundred dollars a year that you can use toward the purchase of, of wine and spirits. And so um, those sorts of things, I think, will um, be an ongoing part of uh, the, the strategy uh, go forward. Let's pivot and cover some uh, effective strategies um, your team is implementing to stay current and adapt to the evolving regulations that impact employee compensation and benefits. Uh, are there some uh, specific resources available for organizations to stay current and abreast 
Uh, Cameron, interested in hearing uh, what you and your team are, are doing at Confluent today. Yeah, I mean, my, my go-to is always my internal legal team first. Like they're, <laughs> they're usually on top of this stuff and then, you know, they're going to have external uh, folks, whether it's Baker or Cooley or some of the better known names out there. Obviously, you know, they're not free, but you know, if you don't, if you don't have the resources internally, like we've actually gone to Cooley, who's one of our external council partners on a lot of the exec comp changing regulations. Now I know that's not what everyone does here, but you know, that's what I've seen most over the last 12 months is just a lot of changes in the exec comp landscape. Um, whether it be some, some laws that were enacted a while ago that are sort of making their way to the forefront, um, or just through our company because we went IPO uh, in 2021, we're, we're subject to you know the the CEO um, pay requirements and reporting and things like that. But when it comes to laws around you know some of the pay transparency, you know we talked a little bit earlier about postings and, and you know having to put salaries in there. You know we've sort of taken the least common denominator in some of this, and so we've been pretty transparent with pay in our postings for for a little bit of time now. And, and because we're fully remote, like some of these other folks, um, it's not required in every state necessarily, but we've sort of just said, let's take one approach to all of these laws, like let's either do it or not, and let's do it inert, let's do it nationally and let's do it not. And we've also tried to do it internationally where it makes sense. So we're not fully posting pay ranges internationally for, for positions because there's a lot of you know red tape around that. But we've instructed our recruiters to do things like uh, verbally communicate what the range is um, when they're talking to a candidate. So, you know, that that's one thing I think, you know, making the whole remote workforce sort of, I can work wherever I want to some degree if we have a payroll office and an entity. I didn't see that before this, right? So as these regulations are coming out, I found it helpful to just take take a stance, draw a line in the sand, and then just go for it. Um, now that can't be applied to everything, but I do think the pay transparency, you know, and a couple of years ago on the sort of like, hey, you can't ask for compensation anymore. I forget what the, I, I used to have that law seared into my brain in California. Like I knew the law number, um, but we took the stance, you know, when I was at Apple on sort of like, hey, let's just go ahead and, 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 and do it. We're not going to have folks in California versus not. So I think taking, you know, a stance on those that are clear in one direction or another works. Um, I also think that, you know, the fewer resources you have internally, it is picking the right external partners, whether it be a law firm or a consulting agency like a Mercer or a Towers Watson or something like that, like, um, and balancing, you know, the services they provide against the budget you have. But um, I would be, I would be lost without some of my partners out there. And that is both on the comp and Ben space, right? I, I work with Mercer currently on the benefit space, and I have a team that, is phenomenal um, just when it comes to, to going to them. And there's there's other folks out there too. It doesn't have to be one of the top firms out there because again, they're not cheap, but um, having those external partners that are seeing what other companies are doing real time has been super valuable with, with things changing so quickly. Well, of course, we'd all be remiss if we didn't say, please look at the Halo Consulting YouTube videos to really keep abreast of the changing landscape in total rewards. Did I say that right, Doug? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would just add yeah. to, I totally agree. I have a different expert that I need to go to for executive comp versus our benefits broker versus our relocation. We just have someone uh, who's moving out of the country for the first time. So we're dealing with Anderson in terms of their tax department. So there's so many experts, there'd be no way that I could ever know all the legislative requirements going on with all these things. So I, I heavily rely on, on experts. Yeah, and I'll um, you know add to that uh, between Mercer, Willis Towers, Watson, Aon, you kind of your your your, your comp consultant, um, retirement, health and welfare, broad based comp, exec comp, equity comp. There's somebody that um, can provide expertise on all of those topics, and they will you know typically provide it free of charge um, because they're trying to get some sort of ancillary business and expand the relationship. So there are a lot of great resources to leverage. Um, and the reward space is, hey, on top of the you know legal and regulatory environment. Um, I think that the challenge is, is sometimes um, figuring out how to you know take that knowledge and um, determine um, you know, just how much of it you're, you've got the ability to engage uh, with and synthesize at any given point in time. But there is, is no shortage of resources available on this space today, Halo included. 
yeah. and, and rely on peers, right? I mean, uh, in terms of the um, here at the conference board or there's groups like the HR Policy Association, I4CP, other groups where you can speak to your counterparts in other organizations and find out what they're, what they're facing and how they're dealing with things. Thanks everyone. Uh, we, we did just have our first question come in from the audience. Um, so a question for the panel, uh, how do you see the changing regulations and compensation impacting the design and implementation of total reward programs uh, in the near future? So that's a good question. I, if I think about some of the you know big changes right now, I mean, as Cameron highlighted, they you know are, are existing in the exact comp uh, space. There are some you know laws related to Dodd Frank that you know happened back in two thousand eight that are just now coming uh, to the forefront in the way that um, you know pay needs to be disclosed. Um, I think that uh, in the short term, that will not really have any significant impacts on the way that uh, companies think about, um, you know, pay. But I think that um, over the long term, particularly as we think about human capital disclosures and the focus on ESG metrics and some other things, still start to become more prevalent that there's going to be um, a shift in incentive design to, to be focused on, um, you know, not just business results, but more, more qualitative factors. Uh, that um, both both shareholders and um, you know other you know community stakeholders uh, may may place a lot of value on. I, I would I would add to that. I think Rory is absolutely right and brought some really great points. It is first about your reward strategy should focus should be focused on your business strategy, and not just looking at and and then look at the regulations and make make tweaks where you need to to make sure you're you're compliant. But if you're doing the right thing, you're if if this if you have the right measures driving performance, and you so then be confident that you could disclose them and and articulate them to shareholders. I think that's what's really the most important thing that I look at. We are still, you know, in terms of this has regulations, but I would add just pay equity and transparency to that as well. Just directionally, we are still trying to figure out all the different ways that we can meet the evolving environment. Uh, whether it's doing some education on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at merit time or throughout the year, or doing a formal pay equity study. Um, we we don't, haven't taken as many steps as we want to take, and we're still kind of figuring out what will they be. And again, what can we manage and what can we, you know, we maybe need to wait for six months to a year to do. So um, that is really our focus, I would see, in the evolving landscape. It's, it's the pay transparency and pay equity analyses and action after that has become a big focus for us. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, one other question um, that, that we wanna address, um, how, if at all, do other rewards provided to your employees beyond cash compensation factor in, into determining cash compensation packages? Uh, and should these other rewards play a role in influencing how compensation packages are determined? And if so, to what degree? How do you balance these factors against maintaining equal pay? I, I, I Just real quick from my point of view, we. I don't try to over-engineer it. And again, I've, I've only worked for pretty large companies. Um, I would imagine if you're a company that's 40 or 50 people, you really have to think about this a lot more closely, but we tend to follow benchmark. And, and you know, we, we while we have a value proposition that encompasses sort of all of your rewards, we do sort of still look at comp and benefits in a different lens. And that if I'm offering more on in terms of mental health or paid time off, I'm not necessarily letting that impact my comp equation. And so it's it's a pretty classical model that's held up. Um, and I think it's held up for good reason. But again, when you're when you're struggling every dime and penny, I, I think it does matter a little bit more. So I don't know where the threshold is. We're 2,700 right now. And some of the other companies I've worked for are in the hundred th hundreds of thousands. But um, I, I found just, sort of benchmarking them separately, but having the offerings that, that you want to achieve for your value proposition is what we focus on. And then again, it's, it's very benchmark driven, but separate. Yeah, I'll just add, I think it's for understanding what you wanna be known for, for your employee value proposition, right? It's start with the holistic picture because in a sense, if you have wonderful career growth and you're moving, people will always be paid below the market because they'll never be in a job grade long enough to, to get 10 increases and be above midpoint. They're, they're moving, they're growing. Um, you know, I think the classic example of that balance is let's take the, the airline industry, right? You can suppress some wages because people go and get, I get free travel benefits. So that factors into, you know, their value proposition, you know, to a certain extent. 
and I and I think, as I said earlier, in the in the in the employee's mind or the candidate's mind now, this flexibility, time off, reputation. Um, Rory mentioned ESG before. How is a company pursuing some of those initiatives? The reputation, the purpose. Those are, I mean, in a sense, very very tangible in in a candidate's mind or a, a, a team member's mind in terms of staying and and being engaged. Deb, did did you have some context you wanted to add? Yeah, I would say um, my current company, uh, we do health care for people who are older adults on Medicare, um, and it's a value-based um, service, so it's not fee-for-service. It's kind of a different type of model, and people are just so into our mission. I've never worked for a company like this where they are willing to, you know, our doctors are willing to make less cash be, to be able to be part of this, just the way that we treat our patients and the whole program, so we really, really try to emphasize everything with that because that's free for, you know, the mission is not something you have to pay for. And it's been able to attract and retain people beyond what I ever would have thought would be possible. Um, so I've really seen the value of, of these non, you know, intangible non-cash type things and what they can, what they can bring. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll add there is a to Cameron's point, ultimately you select the place that you want to be in the market on compensation, whether that's the midpoint or you know, the 75th percentile, however you, you want to target um, you know, on cash um, and, and, uh, and, and total target direct, uh, including stock comp. And uh, you, you evaluate that independently from the, um, the benefits decision. Uh, that said, um, depending on uh, where, where and how you want to compete uh, for talent, there may be other things that you need to emphasize differently. For years, Brown Foreman um, would say, hey, we are a premium you know, pay company. And then once we went through this enterprise, you know, review to understand where we sit on the market, I understood that we actually are a, a, you know, a median pay company. And so uh, in delivering that message to employees and you know, being transparent and set, sharing uh, where they sat in the, the ranges, um, we also took this additive uh, step of saying, but hey, here are the other benefits that you get um, of working here. And there's a much stronger focus on um, premium employee experience because this is a great place to work and there are all these wonderful things associated with that. And um, it became something that was more important to highlight uh, once we were no longer saying, hey, we're a premium pay company. So I think that there's a there's a balance there as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, Cameron, we, we have a specific question for you that came in from the audience. Uh, what, what was your biggest challenges uh, and how did you overcome them with regards to total rewards at Blizzard just after its massive scale and being a founder-based environment? Yeah, that, that 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 brings back some uh <laughs> some fun times. Uh yeah, it it you know, there were some interesting challenges there. One was that that you know, they sort of had a 10-year base profit sharing plan. Uh and given the massive success of World of Warcraft at the time and just sort of the meteoric rise, uh they sort of had more money than they knew what to do with and and they uh they had this bonus plan that was pretty crazy and um you know, resetting expectations for that was one. Um, really balancing with the founder-led uh, team and talking about the future long-term uh, was a big challenge, sort of like, hey, it's rosy today. It won't always be rosy. Let's sort of save some money for the future in these residuals. And so taking some money from today and, 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 and putting it uh, away for a rainy day was a big conversation. I remember that was a lot of push and pull, like, we want to reward folks for the crunch that they just had to launch this game. And, and yet you're sort of having somebody like me coming in and saying like, it's not always going to be the top dog out there. Um, so that was a big challenge. And then just sort of setting expectations around at the time, Blizzard and Activision were sort of in this marriage, Activision being a publisher, Blizzard being a developer. So sort of the creative versus the top and bottom line, more, more the bottom line on the, on the publisher. So I would say just setting things up. It's almost like your kid's college fund, like just setting things up for the future uh, where things won't always be the way they are today was my biggest challenge, um, especially with co-founders that were so passionate about what they were doing um, that they maybe couldn't see the forest through the trees and that, you know, there would be some down years. And, and what I wanted to sort of let them know is that it's important to give people predictability if you're paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars in bonus this year and nothing the next year, not everybody's as good of a saver as everyone else. And it's really important to sort of create this trajectory for folks. And you'll see it in big companies, all the big tech companies sort of have these modeling tools that employees can go and look at what the next four or five years of comp look like under certain assumptions. 
they didn't have anything like that. And they didn't have a, a mechanism like stock-based comp. It wasn't a big stock-based comp company. Not many entertainment companies are. So to give sort of employees a little bit of, of, a, of a smooth outlook was, was a really big challenge that, you know, that they figured out eventually, but it was, it was definitely some growing pains today versus tomorrow. I hope that helps. Um, whoever asked that, I'm happy to, to chat on LinkedIn or whatever if you find me in more detail. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Um, yeah, the, the, the individual that asked that question, you know, very, very appreciative of your response and very helpful. Um, one other question we, that came in from the audience that we want to address, uh, what strategies uh, does the panel use for analyzing internal pay equity? Uh, I could start a little bit on that. Uh, my uh, former company, when I was at uh, Nordstrom, we um, had a number of, uh, I don't know, I'll say challenges in the beginning around, especially in our technology organization of people feeling, you know, they're not paid to the market or there's internal uh, comparisons. So um, we actually partnered with a, a company called uh, Syndio um, that came a number of, that was based out of Seattle, but they, their systems and their algorithms were amazing to be able to really accelerate our ability to do internal pay equity analyses to see where we might have, you know, be in the yellow zone, the green zone or the red zone and, and uh, make the right investments to ensure that we, we, we resolve that issue. Now, again, as I said earlier, this is a lot more complicated now with a remote first work environment um, and then how to, you know, how to, how to manage that. But um, I found that that the using that third party was much more efficient than let's say, you know, partnering with your legal group and doing analysis that might take six months to do, you know, two departments. So um, I, I think that really helped us accelerate the work by partnering with them. Um, you know, we, you know, do, you know, multi-factor regression analysis through, you know, we use Payscale, but there, there are all sorts of different tools or outside consultants you can use to, um, you know, see if you can explain uh, differences and, and pay. You work closely with um, you know, your, your, your legal counsel, your, um, your, your consultant, uh, make sure that um, if there are any explainable differences around pay, uh, that you then, unexplainable differences around pay, that you market price those roles um, each year, and then you do the, the appropriate um, adjustments. So I, I would say it's, a, it's an annual basis um, that we look at um, these pay decisions, and you've got to be, um, you know, thoughtful to make sure that you've got a good understanding of, um, of the roles. I've seen this be, you know, as, you know, quick as just, yeah, us running our own numbers and trying to figure it out internally versus at my last company, we used an outside vendor too, and it was very statistical and very, um, very specific. So I think it just runs the gamut. But one of the things we've talked about at our leadership level is giving people, the management specifically first enough education about how to even make better pay decisions, because we don't know that that's even there. So even if we would right size maybe something that needs to be right size, we don't have the confidence yet to know that people really understand what would be a helpful going forward. So um, a lot of things that we want to build up and we may get to using an outside vendor, but we're, we're not quite there. We think we have a lot of work to do first internally. We do also annually look, we call them cohorts, so cohort by cohort, you know, whether it's our nurses, our medical assistants, um, and what have you. So we do every year take a look too and make adjustments as we need to. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, employees are seeking a positive employee experiment, uh, experience that includes recognition, career development opportunities, and work-life balance initiatives. Uh, what approach has the, the panel taken to ensure their employees are at the forefront? So let's start with uh, your response to this question. Oh, get off mute. Okay, yeah, I, well, First, it's about it's about measurement, right? It's about here getting the pulse uh, of of our team members, as we call them, across the organization. So we'll do uh, uh, you know pulse surveys um, through through the year. Um, number two, it's around looking at uh, as we sort of talked about it earlier that the holistic value proposition and showing and with that, it's about showing respect for for our team members in the sense of so as I mentioned, we're a national based company but we're remote first, except for, you know, manufacturing in, in that regard. But, um, you know, setting up certain parameters where we don't, we use central time as our barometer, but we don't start meetings before 9 a.m. or we don't start a meeting after 5 p.m. central time. Um, we basically preserve a lunch hour. Unfortunately for me on the West Coast, it's 10 a.m. to 11, but it, in Nashville, it's noon to one. And then we don't start any meetings um, on Fridays after, uh, after 2 p.m. national time. So, and then 
we, we state an explanation uh, or an expectation that, um, you know, if it's, if it's on email, you know, you have 24 hours to respond. Don't, you know, it's not about responding in the moment or using that as if you used instant messaging or things of that nature. Give people some space, um, you know, to, to do things. Uh, another example, uh, March 3rd, we closed the company down for Employee Appreciation Day. So everybody got a, you know, a PTO or a free, a free day. It's not even, they didn't have to use PTO. Or if you were in manufacturing or in a shop that we have our smile shops, you got an additional PTO to use at another, at another day. So it's doing those kinds of things to show that you respect the individual. Um, you, you create a work-life balance framework that you can, that you can uh, work between and then celebrate a lot. You know, we'll do, you know, monthly celebration video chats. Um, Try to get you will have a dj you know we'll, we'll do different things to get people across or across departments being able to know each other because one of the downsides of remote first is these meetings tend to be transactional in nature right well i'm going to speak to my account a person in finance to solve this or not you're not bumping into someone you know at the water cooler and say wow what a great baseball game that was last night and finding out more about them but you got to try to recreate that in, in 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 the virtual world so that's what we're trying to do as well any any context from from the rest of the panel to chime in on we we also are very heavy with engagement surveys and pulse surveys so we do it more frequently than i've ever seen a company do it but it's it's helpful one of the things that's been interesting is that we don't always get it right in terms of what matters to people we gave people um, kind of similar to what rory has said in like a thank you equity grant where everybody got a thousand dollars in stock and our CEO still talks about the fact that when people got a mug that said I had our name, like a piece of swag, he got more thank yous for that than the thousand dollars of stock. And so it's just interesting to, you know, realize that we have to really get a better pulse of what matters to people. We know time off and flexibility is really huge. I'm actually on a task force to look at flexibility in our medical centers, um, potentially even more than pay. This is what people talk about on our engagement surveys. So I think just getting it right, not making assumptions on what you think people want, but really asking them and talking to them, whether it's an engagement survey or I've done focus groups, I, I think you have to kind of get to the bottom of that first. No, that is interesting. I used to do a listening tour twice a year in one of my old uh, companies, and, and we were struggling, pre, of course, way pre-COVID with flexibility in the workplace and whatnot. And I kept showing the CEO all these surveys about workplace flexibility. But then I was, I remember I was in Atlanta at our technology center and one person just raised their hand and said, you know, how come the company can trust me to answer emails from home on Saturday and Sunday, but they don't trust me to do that on a Friday. And, you know, I took that back to our executive team and find, and right there, the CEO just said, how stupid can we be? We have to trust our employees. And, you know, all the surveys in the world didn't mean anything, but that one person who raised that, who posed that question that way, you know, changed our uh, our work life balance policy. So, and I went back six months later and and thank you know let them know that was their idea. You know, and it, and it and it came to fruition. Let's move on to our our, our next question. Uh, many organizations are facing pressure to ensure all employees are paid fairly and without bias. Uh, what approaches is the panel taking to effectively communicate to employees that uh, their compensation structure is equitable and transparent? Rory, uh, do you mind kicking off uh, your response? Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is um, a multi-year initiative that uh, we actually just wrapped up at uh, Brown Foreman, where we looked across the entire company and uh, market priced uh, every single role, um, did you know global job level alignment, got very comfortable with um, you know where employees were sitting in their their range. Uh, from there, um, you know, socialized with our um, executive uh, leadership team, uh, how we define the market, what we define as the competitive range. We said, hey, it's 90 uh, to one, you know, 10% um, on you know, total compensation. And we you know, said, hey, here's this flex zone up to 120. Um, and, you know, really just walked our entire leadership team uh, through our pay philosophy, the way, uh, explain to them the way that our pay programs work. Uh, and then, um, you know, put together some video communications um, to employees uh, explaining that pay philosophy and uh, we rolled it out at the same time uh, that we communicated um, to any employee that was below what we defined as um, kind of the competitive minimum of the range is where we made this multi-million dollar capital investment uh, to, uh, to to give them, them pay increases. And so it was something that got a lot of traction on the organization 
25% or so of our salary workforce um, got increases, some of them very small increases, but they did get, get increases and it, it built, built a very strong awareness of our pay programs and what um, they are and what the purpose of them is. I think that the challenge that um, I found that we have to work through now is, you know, employees come back and they ask questions about, hey, what is my comp ratio? Can you explain to me where, where I'm sitting in the range? Those are questions that, um, you know, our total rewards team is armed to answer. They're questions that, you know, many of our HR business partners are, are ready to answer, but um, our managers are not at that that um, you know level um, of um, development and you know, from a compensation standpoint at this time. And so uh, it's creating a lot of um, you know volume in the, the system, if you will, from a, a reward standpoint. But I, I think that going through that exercise of starting at the top of the organization to ensure alignment and understanding the way pay programs work and then cascading that um, you know down to employees at the same time that we're making impactful decisions around pay that um, that shows them that um, that the that, that, that the the program is meaningful has been been hugely impactful from an organizational standpoint. Yeah, I'd like to share two things we did. So one is we've always been total compensation focused. So you know we're a, we're a SaaS based tech company. So base bonus stock, or if you're in sales, OTE plus stock. And so we moved towards a model that was total comp focused this year. So like, hey, all of them equally count the same. Here's the number you know, so focus on one number, you know, your base may not be exactly where you want it, your stock, but we're going to focus on one number. If it's hundred K it's hundred K for you. And then we gave every employee that number, which is meant to be a market reference point. So it's sort of the midpoint of our total comp range. Now, what's funny is we didn't, we didn't give out base salary ranges. We don't think we really need to. There's a lot of work being done on offers and new hires with base anyway, but internally this year, through comp planning, we sort of set up a total comp structure and we gave every employee what their market reference point was, which is what we called it. And you're either above or below it. And then we worked with managers on sort of how to talk to their employees about it. And if you're above or below it, you know, some of what, what are the, what are some of the reasons why? And it's not a perfect, you know, leave the employee census on the printer and we're proud of it and everyone's in the right spot, but it it, it has enabled employees to start talking with their peers around why is my market reference point different than someone else's? And it's going to be geography, different job, different level, those sorts of things. And so alongside with that, we developed the most transparent and largest internal wiki I've ever done in my career. So more transparent than anything I've done is to sort of why would, what drives a market reference point? What are the survey inputs? And then sort of how do I create a scenario where my total comp goes up, right? Performance rating, high potential, key talent, those sorts of things, get a promotion. And uh, we're only about three months into it. Um, And there are people that don't like it and there are people that love it, but either way, it gives employees sort of this tool um, to have the discussion with their manager, with their peers and things like that. And it could crash and burn in an epic way. Uh, but we think that it's it's going to be, uh, we don't really think that, but you never know. Um, but it, it's happening either way. Gen Z is sort of coming up. Things with the pandemic have demanded, you know, it, it's fast forwarded trends that were in our industry for a long time. And so it's, I think it was, it, it was, it was either Deb or Bill that said like, it's not like the biggest number anymore that that is going to get someone. They want transparency. They want equity. They want time, you know, they want to work life. And so giving them data points that we've had for years and these traditional comp functions is sort of something I think is really interesting right now. And, um, you know, it's going to be a a really good academic experiment to see sort of what they do with these numbers. I mean, they're doing it anyway with spreadsheets online and Slack has been the biggest empowerment tool for employees and a generation to sort of share whatever they want, whenever they want. And so we're sort of giving it to them and wait, waiting and see what they do with it. Uh, but I'm hugely interested to see what happens. Um, Bill or Deb, any any context uh, to add? Communicating, I would just say, yeah, communicating that total number is something we've, we've striven to do as well. Um, we might not be here with one, but when you look at it holistically, it's been hard though. It's been hard to get people to appreciate that that full number. There's Our population is still pretty stuck on base. So it's been an evolution for us to try to get there. We've modified our offer letters uh, to actually start out to say, hey, your your total compensation target is $600,000 a year. Now, your base may be three hundred dollars or two hundred, dollars 
but then your bonus, because too often we start with one of the smaller numbers <laughs> that we're offering is the base pay. And then we say, and you have a 15 or 30% target or 50%, and we don't even put it out there, right? We don't get, to get the credit for it. So we're trying to start with the big picture and then let's tell you how you can, you know, how you get there and what are the components. Thanks everyone. Um, the next question, uh, in regards to retaining top talent in a pre-recession and competitive market, uh, top employees are receiving uh, competitive compensation packages and, and benefits uh, from jumping ship. Uh, Deb, can you touch on uh, how your organization is handling this and you know what are the long-term effects for the bottom line? Sure, um, this is a really important topic for us right now because in addition to our people getting phone calls every day to be poached to competitors, we've got a few other things going on we went public three years ago and everyone's stock from that is about to vest this summer. So we're very concerned that people could jump ship because of that reason as well. Um, in addition, um, we just found out we uh, are getting acquired by CVS Health. So you have this big acquisition on the heels of all of this as well, which we think, you know, is making people potentially nervous and just thinking about where they are and where they want to be. So we just went through a very um, extensive talent review to very, um, precisely narrow the people that we think are mission critical that we want to retain. We had all of our top executives. It was um, like around a half a day and made some really um, big decisions in terms of what we are going to do in terms of what we call retention grants. Uh, it could be in the form of stock. It could be in the form of cash, but um, or it just something we're calling a transaction bonus to help with the CVS um, situation. But, but we really thought that exercise was necessary and to put real dollars behind this, that would also, um, even if it was cash, that would vest over a few years to try to really just, again, double down on trying to retain our top people. It's interesting, you know, we are doing certain things for, for everybody that, you know, for instance, everybody will get a transaction bonus. But um, one of the things that has been instilled to me by my leaders is that if a leader leaves amidst all of this, it could really cause more disruption than I think even I had even realized. And so um, really trying to keep leaders intact will help people in their lanes as well. And so um, I, I would have thought, you know, maybe just disperse more to everybody. But the thought was that, you know, what if, if one top leader leaves, you're going to see a lot of people start to, to leave as well. Let's try to keep at least that level in place. But we did we did roll it down further, too. Um, so we like I said, we, we put a lot of effort and, in, in, you know, funds behind doing this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, I think pay is important, but I think, you know, as some people say people leave leaders, people leave organizations. So it's about creating that belief in the company and belief in the purpose of what you're trying to do. Because as we all know, just pay, paying the 65th percentile, you're going to have thir a third of the companies paying more than you. And so that will always be, that will always be out there. And, and sometimes that, um, and again, churn creates innovation. You know, someone's jumping ship is our new person who's going to come up with a great idea. Um, you know, what was it at the end of the, I think it was at the end of the Vietnam War and these engineers were, were laid off and not needed by the, for, by the military. And they went to Silicon Valley and created, you know, Fairchild Semiconductor and started the whole semiconductor industry. So sometimes this, this churn is sparks innovation and sparks growth. Uh, and it's not a drag on the bottom line, but actually an enhancement to the bottom line. I'll just and, you know, in this regard, there's no such thing as never, but for the most part, we have uh, not done a whole lot of counteroffers or responses to, um, you know, this broader, um, you know, macro environment where, where people are going out and getting, um, you know, competitive uh, offers. If, if talent, you know, decides that's the right decision for their uh, career, uh, for the most part, if you, you focus on bench strength and um, you have and, and knowledge transfer, you can afford to um, to lose most, most, most people, although you prefer to, um, to keep, keep key talent. I would say that one of the proactive steps that we've taken is just being very thoughtful about understanding, uh, where everyone is sitting, uh, relative, um, to the, the competitive midpoint on the range over the course of a year. And if there's something that we see that doesn't make sense, uh, we, we take those proactive steps to, uh, increase their compensation, um, yeah, at that point in time. The last thing I'll say there is at the end of the day, if somebody wants to go out and um, get more money, if they're any you know, good, they typically can. And so the, you know, trying to, to compete um, for talent by being at the top of uh, the, the range on COP is not, you know, necessarily the most effective strategy. I think it's more so making sure that people are paid competitively and that they feel valued for, for what they do.
All right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I uh, wanna give a, a very special thank you to our panelists for a uh, very informative and, and educational discussion. Uh, feel free to scan their QR code to connect with them on LinkedIn. Uh, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for past events, including the Halo series and mini series, uh, where we feature thought leaders in a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, discussing what is keeping them up at night. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please keep an eye out for the survey request early next week. Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, we will have a version uh, of our discussion uploaded to YouTube on Monday, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.